Neuromycin biochemistry is, well, purely awesome. It can be used to do things like label growing proteins, um, things for like mRNA display, so you can um, select for proteins and actually link them to the mRNA with the instructions that made them to find, um, like test big libraries, um, all this really, really cool stuff. And so today's post is just kind of a whirlwind overview of pyromycin and some cool things that you can do with it. Um, and because I was just learning about it, it's really cool, so I don't have a, like a really structured um, write up or anything. But I just really wanted to share because I was just learning. It. I was just this is so fascinating. Okay, let's dive in. So today's post is going to be more technical. So check out other posts on translation if you need more background. But basically, translation is this process in which we're going to make a protein by linking together the amino acids of the protein letters that make it up in the order that is specified by the messenger RNA template. And it's going to happen catalyzed or sped up and mediated by this complex of protein and amino acids, protein and RNA that's called the ribosome. And it's going to, this, these tRNAs, so these transfer RNAs are going to bring the amino acids to get added. These transfer RNAs, they have the, um, in the messenger RNA, so in the instructions, three letters is going to mean a codon, and that's going to spell for a specific amino acid. The tRNA is then going to bring the complementary, I mean, bring the amino acid that it match that is like coded for by the messenger RNA, and it's going to have a complementary anticodon. So this is going to allow the specific amino acids to, the specific tRNAs to bring the specific amino acids that match the, um, what the mRNA is telling the ribosome to add. And so this is how you get your amino acids added in the right order. And how they add in the right order is that one of the tRNAs is actually going to, um, this incoming tRNA is going to attack the growing chain and the growing chain is going to get transferred onto that incoming tRNA. And then everything's gonna kind of shift over. And it happens with the help of some like elongation factors, which are going to help shift things over. So the ribosome has these three sites for where tRNAs can be located. The P site um, is this is where the growing chain is held. The A site is a, this is where the tRNA is going to enter, and the E site is where it's going to exit. And so the new the the codon that's getting read is in the A site, the matching tRNA comes in. Then this, um, the incoming one is going to attack the one, in the chain in the B site. The chain gets transferred and now you have to shift everything over so that the growing chain is once again in the P site and the A site is empty so that a new tRNA can come in and then the old one gets um, booted out the E site. So this keeps happening over and over and over until you reach a termination signal, so a stop codon. And at the stop codon, what's going to happen is that a release factor is going to come in and it's going to bind into this A site instead, and it's going to um, cause this to get released. But what happens if something that's not a tRNA binds? What happens if something that looks like a tRNA binds, but isn't a tRNA. And so this is what happens in the case of pyromycin. So with pyromycin, instead of elongation, instead of a new tRNA coming in that matches this, um, that has the anticodon matching this codon in the A site, and the tRNA comes in and the chain gets transferred, and then you do this again and again and again. Instead, what happens is if you add pyromycin, you're going to get it added. So it's going to attack that growing chain. It's going to get the chain transferred to it, but now it can't elongate further. So it's like a dead end, and this is going to get released. And so you have this like, pyromycelated, um, pyromycelated polypeptide. And so the consequence of this is that you could have your premature termination because instead of having, a, if this is a codon that's actually spelling for an amino, coding for an amino acid, well now instead you have pyromycin there and nothing else can get added. And so your chain is going to terminate. And why this is going to happen is because with pyromycin, you can form that original bond, but then that bond is stable and unbreakable. So the basic, or oh, unbreakable, it's more stable than this ester bond that, in, that you see with the tRNA. So this is pyromycin, and you can see that it looks a lot like the end of the tyrosyl tRNA. So it looks like the tRNA that's loaded with tyrosine.
There's a little bit of a difference uh, in a couple of places. So you can see this acetyl group. Um, you can see there's a couple extra methyl groups here on the um, on the nucleotide part. But what is really the most important is that this part, so you have a nitrogen here, whereas you have an oxygen here. So this is an amide bond, this is a peptide bond. So this is like the bonds in the backbone of proteins. And as we talked about before, those bonds are really stable, they're really sturdy. This is an ester bond, it's much more labile. And this is why when you're adding the tRNAs, you can add um, and then you can like attack and you can break this off. So this is where the amino acid part gets linked to the tRNA part. So this is the part that's coming from the RNA. And this is the part that was come, that is the amino acid. When you're actually loading the, the tRNA, so when you're charging them, when you're adding them to the um, to the to the tRNA, you see you're having it in this ester bond, and this is going to allow it so that you can link it. And when the peptide bond forms, this is going to break. When the, so when the new peptide bond forms, this is going to break, and then it, it can keep happening over and over and over, and so it's getting passed off. But here, this is not going to be um, subject to attack. So when you have this come in, this isn't going to be able to break off. So you're not going to get the elongation of the chain that you would need. So if we look at the structures of the tyrosyltyrene and the pyramycin, both of them have this free amino group, and this free amino group is going to be what's going to attack the carbonyl carbon on the growing chain. But it here you have an ester bond and here you have an amide bond. So the outcomes are going to be different. In the first case, they're both going to um, attack. So they both have that free amino group. And so that free amino group can attack, um, can attack that carbonyl carbon. And so you're going to get it added on because it's going to attack this, this ester bond is going to break. Now you have another ester bond. Um, you have another ester bond here. But here you're going to have an amide bond, and this amide bond isn't going to be able to be attacked by um, a tRNA that comes in next, whereas this is. And so this is why this is going to terminate, but this is going to keep elongating. So you might have heard about pyromycin in the context of like pyromycin-based selection. So we've talked some about antibiotic selection that we can use in bacteria. And often we're doing this, we take some like a plasmid. So we have the circular piece of DNA that we stick into bacteria. And this DNA has the instructions for making something we want the bacteria to make for us. And to, in order to select or like only allow the cells that have that to grow or that have the plasma to grow. In addition to our gene of interest, we have a gene for a antibacterial um, for a antibiotic resistance gene. And so then we can grow in the presence of that antibiotic and then only cells that have that antibiotic resistance gene will be able to, work, to survive. And these can work in different ways depending on the different antibiotic and more on that in other posts. But a lot of the antibiotics we use actually target the ribosome because protein making is really, really important. And if you can't make protein, you can't survive. And so we can use antibiotics that target bacterial proteins, uh, bacterial ribosomes, in order to inhibit them. And often what we're doing is we're using antibiotics that specifically target bacterial ribosomes and not our own ribosomes because we don't want to kill the patient when we're treating them with the antibiotic if we're doing um, that sort of thing. But there are also times when we want to use antibiotics that do target like um, mammalian ribosomes. We're doing various cell culture things. So we want to do something similar to this, but in like human cells or in some other sort of cells in a dish. And so here, instead of using these antibiotic, um, antibacterial antibiotics, we want to use like an antibiotic that is going to be effective at inhibiting um, the ribosomes that are actually in the cells so that we can use selection. And a way that we can do this is with pyromycin-based selection. So pyromycin isn't really used in therapeutics and stuff because of toxicity issues, but it is used sometimes in, a lot in cell culture. And you can do something, you can add a, make the cells resistant to it. So like you have, like we had solved with this type of selection. Here in, for our resistance gene, we would have this pyromycin and acetyltransferase or PAC.
And what it does is it acetylates pyromycin's reactive amino group. So going back to our structures, remember how we have this free amino group and that's going to allow it um, to attack the growing chain and get the chain transferred to it. But if we block this, then we can no longer have that happen. And so this pyromycin resistance can be happen if you block that. And so basically this PAC enzyme is going to block that a free amino group. So you no longer have a free amino group. Instead, you have this acetyl group. And so now this can't interfere with translation. And so only cells that have that PAC gene can grow and those that don't have it um, cannot. So this is what happens if you have a lot of pyromycin. This is going to inhibit. But what happens if you don't have a lot of pyromycin? So it turns out that pyromycin is able to, because it's not actually recognizing a, a codon, it's not like with the tRNAs where it had this codon-anticodon relationship. Instead, it's going to be able to interact like any of these, any free A sites. And so, but it has to be competing with the tRNAs that are applied. How effectively this can happen is going to depend on the concentration of pyromycin. So if you have a lot of pyromycin, it's able to sneak in there a lot. Um, but if you don't have that much, then the tRNA is going to get there first. And if the tRNA gets that first, then you're still gonna have the protein made. But when we talked about translation, what happens at the stop codon is it actually kind of has to stall because what happens at the stop codon is instead of a tRNA getting added, it um, one of those release factors has to come. So that little protein that's going to help kick things off. And the um, so because it takes longer for that to happen, the pyromycin is able to sneak in there, even if it's um, at a lower concentration. So even if it's a concentration that's not going to kill the cells and it's not going to halt the translation prematurely, in this case, it's going to label or it's going to get added to the protein after it's already made. And so you're going to get a full-length pyromycinated protein. And what's cool about this is that you can do you then use that to recognize the pyromycin li labeled things and do things. So you can use like anti-pyromycin antibodies. So antibodies that recognize the pyromycin, um, maybe these antibodies are labeled and then you can um, visualize things that were pyromycinated, or maybe you can um, use antibodies conjugated or attached to like little beads to isolate the pyromycinated things. So this is kind of using this intermediary, but you can also make modifications to pyromycin. Often modifications are placed here at like the three prime end or at the five prime end. And what they're going to do is they're going to allow this to be directly visualized or directly captured. So say you can biotinylate this and then you can use streptavid encoded beads to attach it, um, or you can directly conjugate um, like a fluorescent dye so that you can label things. So there's a lot of really cool things that you can do with this pyromycin labeling of the proteins that are made. And if you do things like pulse labeling where you add the label of a specific time, then you can detect newly made proteins and when they're being made, that sort of thing. There are also other things that you can do um, with pyromycin labeling. It's a really cool thing is this mRNA display. And so in this case, the idea what you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get, the, get a protein to be labeled, but to be labeled in a way that is going, actually it attaches it to the messenger RNA that makes it. And so the, the key thing here is that you're linking the protein to the messenger RNA that has the instructions for making the protein. And why this is important is because you can do things if you're doing like in vitro translation or like cell-free expression, where you're basically putting the instructions for making a protein into um, either like a purified mix of the components that you need or a cell lysate, so you like break open cells. And, but the basic idea is that you have this system where you're not actually inside of cells and you can control things more easily. When what you can do is you can actually stick in messenger RNA templates for making various things. And you can stick in these modified templates that are modified to have a um, to have pyromycin actually attached to them. And so if you attach pyromycin to the end of the messenger RNA, so usually there's some sort of linker here to give it a little room to let it sneak in. Now your pyromycin is right where you need it in order to give it, um, to allow it to have the best chance of sneaking in there. 
And because it's actually attached to the messenger RNA, now your protein is going to get attached to the messenger RNA that made it. So now you can select for proteins of various properties. So you can say, test this, whether this can bind to something. And then you isolate the ones that do bind, and then you can sequence the messenger RNA that they were bound to. So you can use these like giant libraries where you're randomizing things and that sort of thing. And this is going to allow you to then test a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of different ones. And you can even do things like then introduce mutations so that you can um, like select and keep like evolving this um, to make some sort of peptide that binds something or to find various binding partners. Um, various really, really cool stuff that you can do with this idea of messenger RNA display. Um, just a quick note, you might have heard of ribosome display. Um, that's something similar, except that there, what you're doing is you're not having a release factor, so you're actually getting the protein stuck in the ribosome. Whereas here, this is going to be released, um, but then you have this messenger RNA um, protein um, conjugate, so they're linked together. And yeah, so, and if you're doing it in vitro, you can also do things like incorporate um, non-canonical amino acids and cool stuff like that. One last note, uh, so I actually came about into all this pure mice and stuff because I was studying ribosome profiling, um, which is this technique that you can use to see rib where ribosomes are bound on messenger RNA. And I heard about this technique called QTIC that actually uses pure mice to help identify, start initiation sites for translation. Um, so long story short, what happens is that there are other antibiotics that also bind to the ribosome, but in different spots. And so, for example, cyclohexamide and this other um, lactidomycin, this LTM, they bind in the E site. So they bind in that like exit site. And the cyclohexamide is able to compete with tRNAs that were already there. So it can inhibit even if the ribosome is already like along the path on the on this transcript. But what happens is that when you have the this LTM, it can't compete if there's already a tRNA there. And so you're only going to have an MPE site in, at the start codon because the start codon basically you just start with that one tRNA in the P site. So you have an MPE site, so lactidomycin can bind. What's really cool is that then if you introduce puramycin, the puramycin, if there was, um, so if you treat the cells with the lactamycin, it's only going to bind in the ribosomes that were at that initiation site. But then you're also, so you would see like an increase in the signal for that position at the initiation site, but you'd also have a lot of like noise and stuff because there would be ribosomes all along. But if you then treat with puromycin, what happens is that the puromycin is going to cause the trans cause the translating ribosomes to actually dissociate and like release the partial pro the um, so the, per the peptides are going to get purum isolated and released, and then you're going to have the dissociation of the ribosome. And if you dissociate the ribosome, now when you go to isolate the ribosomes and see what they're bound to, you're not going to see them bound to anything. Um, I mean, you're not going to see the signal from those, but you will see the signal bound from the one, the initiation. And why this is, is because in the, the lactomycin, it's actually preventing, because it's in that E site, it's preventing this from dissociating. And so if this can't dissociate, this is going to be stuck here. So you're going to have this stay stuck, these fall off. And then when you go and you isolate the ribosomes and see what it's bound to, you're going to see a nice sharp signal showing you the sites of the initiation. Um, so this, there are other methods too, um, but this was a cool one. And so this is actually how I came across um, all of this other cool stuff about pure mycin. So I just wanted to mention that when I was here. And if anyone wants to know more, I found this really great review article, The Science of Pure Mycin, from Studies of the Ribosome Function to Applications in Biotechnology um, by Ronan Abner. Um, in this computational structural biotechnology journal 2020, um, but it is open access and you can view it. Um, and so I can put a link to that. Okay, so hope that helped. And uh, thanks for letting me geek out.